Hi, I'm Dr. Shonali Chandra. Welcome to our YouTube channel, Medicine Decoded. Now in this uh, video, I'm going to talk about a clinical condition that's jaundice in pregnancy. We're going to focus on the differential diagnosis, the key important features that will help us to arrive at the diagnosis. Now looking at the possible causes, there can be causes which are specific to pregnancy, pregnancy related, and there can be n number of causes which are coincidental to pregnancy, right? For example, there can be medical causes for the jaundice. A woman could be suffering from viral hepatitis, maybe acute, maybe chronic, could be a drug-induced hepatitis, hemolytic anemia, or there could be surgical causes like, you know, gallstones uh, causing obstructive jaundice or, or these variety of biliary tract diseases. And then we have the causes which are very specific and peculiar to pregnancy like obstetric cholestasis, HELP syndrome, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, hyperemesis, gravidarum. And then there can also be causes where jaundice can occur along with, you know, sepsis or even disseminated intravascular coagulation. Right Now, moving on, I would like to focus first of all and give you a brief description of the pregnancy related important causes. So, it's not like that I'm going to talk about in detail about these causes, right? That is going to be a topic for another discussion. I'm going to give you a brief recap or revision of what these conditions are. So, yes, obstetric cholestasis. Now, obstetric cholestasis is a pregnancy related condition. It's an estrogen related condition. And the main symptom is pruritus, itching, generalized itching, typically involving the palms and soles, right? Jaundice can happen in about 10% uh, cases. And whenever it is there, it is usually mild. It hardly ever exceeds uh, more than 5 gram per deciliter, right? It's a conjugated type of hyperbilirubinemia because it is occurring uh, as a result of cholestasis. Right now, the recurrence is also common. So, when you have a woman with a history of itching as the predominant complaint, jaundice may or may not be there. And very important is to know if this has happened to her in previous pregnancies as well. Now, because of uh, the pruritus and constant itching, there may be excoriations wherever she has itched on her body. However, a typical rash is not uh, going to be there. Now, the liver enzymes are elevated, ALT and AST, okay. The alkaline uh, phosphatase levels are also elevated and the diagnosis can be made by checking serum bile acid levels which are going to be elevated. Moving on, let's recap what is HELP syndrome. HELP syndrome is a mnemonic that stands for the presence of hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelet levels. Okay. Now, most of these women are going to have a history of hypertension and preeclampsia, right? So, HELP syndrome is occurring in about, uh, you know, 7 to 10 percent cases of women having preeclampsia. Now, having said that, please remember that it is a severe manifestation of preeclampsia. Secondly, Secondly, a very, very important point to remember is that about 10% uh, cases of uh, HELP syndrome may not have history of hypertension, may not have history of preeclampsia, may not have even proteinuria, right? Now, that can, you know, complicate the diagnosis making. So, when you do not have a history of hypertension or proteinuria or preeclampsia, then the diagnosis is often delayed and confusing. But most of the times, a history of hypertension and preeclampsia is going to be there. Now, what is acute fatty liver of pregnancy? Now, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, fortunately, is rare, okay, and uh, the incidence is about 1 in uh, 10,000 uh, pregnant uh, women. And the recurrence of acute fatty liver of pregnancy is also uncommon. It is most often identified in, uh, you know, primary uh, gravidas. 
and it is also uh, called as acute uh, yellow atrophy run, and there is uh, accumulation of micro vesicular fat in the liver and because of that fat accumulation what happens is that the normal um, hepatocytes are overcrowded and there is marked uh, liver dysfunction that is very characteristic of acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Now it uh, the etiology is um, uncertain most of the times. Uh, however, yes, there is an association uh, between uh, recessively inherited mitochondrial abnormality of fatty acid oxidation and there are various enzyme deficiencies which have been described. One such deficiency is the L-CHAD deficiency standing for long chain uh, hydroxyacyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase deficiency. Now, the clinical presentation is uh, often uh, worsening over a couple of uh, you know several days. So a woman presents with nausea, vomiting, malaise, anorexia, uh, progressive jaundice, sometimes even right upper quadrant pain and epigastric pain as well and these symptoms usually worsen very rapidly over a couple of days. Now uh, about about 50 percent women with acute fatty liver of pregnancy also can have hypertension, proteinuria and edema. Right? So, the uh, differential diagnosis becomes preeclampsia. It can get very confusing to differentiate between acute fatty liver of pregnancy and preeclampsia because of this reason as well. And moreover, because of you know liver injury, there is endothelial cell activation in severe cases. But the most characteristic feature of acute fatty liver of pregnancy is basically the fact that the liver dysfunction is severe and rapidly progressive. So to give you a brief overview of what happens with acute fatty liver of pregnancy, there is acute uh, liver injury like I explained to you. There is uh, endothelial cell activation because of that. And there is increased capillary permeability. Now, this can also lead to edema, right? Now, this can also lead to uh, fluid leakage from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment and obviously that will lead to hemoconcentration. Now another important point to note here is that hemoconcentration in acute fatty liver of pregnancy is very very marked and severe. So much so that it can lead to decreased renal perfusion it can lead to decreased renal perfusion and you know can lead to acute kidney injury and even renal failure right because of severe hepatic dysfunction severe liver dysfunction right the synthetic functions of liver are severely affected in acute fatty liver of pregnancy so much so that a woman could progress into liver failure as well so severe liver dysfunction hypoproteinemia right hypoalbuminemia to be very particular ascites that may lead to ascites okay and the severe liver dysfunction is also going to affect the procoagulant uh, synthesis right so increased risk of coagulopathy severe liver dysfunction can lead to decreased cholesterol hypocholesterolemia 
and this decreased cholesterol has a deleterious effect on the RBC membranes. Deleterious effect on the RBC membranes causing marked hemolysis. Because of severe liver dysfunction, there is increased ammonia, hyperammonemia, right? There is hypoglycemia. All in all, a woman can have rapid development of encephalopathy. So yes, we do see a lot of similarity in the clinical profile of uh, severe preeclampsia, help and acute fatty liver of uh, pregnancy as well. Now to differentiate between acute fatty liver of pregnancy and preeclampsia based on lab parameters, I need to first give you a brief perspective of what happens in preeclampsia. So without going into too much details of pathophysiology and everything, I will just give you a brief description. So, if you have the capillary here and you have the endothelial cell lining, okay. So, in preeclampsia also you have endothelial dysfunction and endothelial damage, okay. So, when that happens, okay, here we see that the platelets in the circulation, they form thrombosis here, okay. So, there is intravascular thrombosis, yeah, we call it microvascular thrombosis, microvascular thrombosis. The platelets are consumed in the process and therefore there is decreased platelet count in preeclampsia, right? We see this happening. Then this endothelial damage is responsible for the fluid leakage and edema and proteinuria as well, okay? Now entrapped RBCs here can undergo hemolysis. So, because of fluid leakage, yes, hemoconcentration you are going to see in preeclampsia also. Fluid leakage, endothelial dysfunction also happens in acute fatty liver of pregnancy, but because the synthetic function of the liver is uh, severely affected and there is severe uh, hypoalbuminemia, the hemoconcentration is much more marked in acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Right? The platelets count can be decreased in both preeclampsia and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Now, as far as the serum fibrinogen levels are concerned, okay, because of decreased procoagulant synthesis, the fibrinogen levels in acute fatty liver of pregnancy are decreased. And because of decreased procoagulant synthesis, the coagulation profile is deranged. The prothrombin time is elevated in acute fatty liver of pregnancy. In preeclampsia, however, on the other hand, fibrinogen levels are usually normal and the coagulation profile and the prothrombin time is also usually normal. Okay. I mean, yes, preeclampsia creates the conducive environment for increased risk of disseminated intravascular coagulation, right? So, yes, when there is associated disseminated intravascular coagulation or some of the other complication, in severe cases, preeclampsia can also have conducive for disseminated intravascular coagulation, right? 
right? Now, the risk of DIC further increases in severe preeclampsia when there is associated hemorrhage. So, until unless preeclampsia gets complicated by these conditions, the prothrombin time is usually normal, the coagulation profile is usually normal. And as far as the hemolysis is concerned, yes, the hemolysis can be seen in both, okay. So, hemolysis is seen here as well. But the hemolysis in preeclampsia is usually mild. Whereas, in cases of acute fatty liver of pregnancy, like I told you that the decreased amount of cholesterol can damage RBC membranes. Uh, so, in addition, uh, the hemolysis in acute fatty liver of pregnancy is marked hemolysis, severe hemolysis. The lab finding of hyperammonemia and hypoglycemia will go in favor of diagnosis of acute fatty liver of pregnancy. This generally does not happen in preeclampsia by itself, all right. So, keep that in mind. Now, with this much background information, let us come back to our differential diagnosis of jaundice in pregnancy. So, when you have to evaluate for jaundice in pregnancy, you just do not have to check the lab parameters, but you have to assess the patient as a whole, right. You will have to look at the entire clinical profile of the patient to arrive at a diagnosis, right. So, you will have to consider the common possibilities first rather than thinking about acute fatty liver of pregnancy as your first diagnosis because it in itself self is rare right so you will have to take the relevant history and note the clinical profile first right now hyperemesis gravidarum is a complication of first trimester of pregnancy so it is going to be seen in the first trimester and uh, sometimes there can be liver dysfunction and that may be severe enough to cause jaundice right so even hyperemesis gravidarum uh, commonly does not lead to liver dysfunction. It has to be really severe and uh, protracted and prolonged hyperemesis to lead to liver dysfunction, right? Moving on, most of these other conditions, these pregnancy related conditions, they are often presenting in late pregnancy, right? Most commonly in the third trimester of pregnancy. So, keep this basic information in mind also. Other than that, these coincidental causes like uh, medical causes, surgical causes, they can present any time during pregnancy. So, they can present at any time during pregnancy and look out for the clinical profile if it is going in favor of DIC. Is there any high risk factor for DIC or is the woman looking in sepsis? Now, there can be other underlying reasons for this which you need to consider as well while evaluating for jaundice, right? So, beginning with history, yes, you need, need to take the history of, uh, you know, maybe a known case of uh, a medical disorder, right? You need to take the uh, drug history as well. You need to know the uh, clinical profile of symptoms, right? So, did she have nausea, vomiting or any gastrointestinal symptoms? Did she have fever or not? So, important points in history are to be noted. History of right upper quadrant pain, maybe a known case of gallstones. You see, you have to ask that as well. Uh, in cases of obstructive jaundice, you will have to go back to your medicine and yes, read up as to what are the typical questions you asked in the patient of jaundice. I mean, you will have to ask if there is history of clay colored stools. Right? So, that would go in favor of obstructive jaundice. So, complete your history first, right? So, you have to take history pertaining to the medical causes. You also have to take history pertaining to the pregnancy related causes, right? So, it becomes easier when it is a booked case, when the woman has been seen previously in pregnancy and uh, medical records are available. You can check for history of high BP in pregnancy, right? You can check history of proteinuria 
uterine pregnancy right you need to note about note about the history of uh, itching if that was the predominant complaint and not jaundice right so you need to take a thorough history make up a clinical profile based on history and then proceed further so what are your immediate concerns when a woman presents with jaundice in pregnancy so yes you do need to assess for the severity of liver dysfunction if she has jaundice how badly are her liver functions affected is there in any evidence of uh, you know associated complications and liver failure if there's any uh, symptom per symptom and sign pertaining to that at the same time you have to work up the patient to find a cause to arrive at a diagnosis that is your concern and finally since she is pregnant now you also have the fetus at as your concern you have to evaluate for fetal well being so these are the uh, four fundamental important concerns that you have to keep in mind while evaluating right so how are you going to go about it uh, so yes like i told you history is very very important so once you've taken a thorough history a thorough history after that you focus on the physical examination right so yes once a woman has come with jaundice you have to note whether she is conscious or drowsy or restless is there any symptom of uh, suggestive of hepatic encephalopathy note the vitals checking the blood pressure is very important checking for urine protein is very important you can do that in the emergency by a simple dipstick and if you have time but obviously you're going to admit such patient at a later point in time you can go for 24 hour urine protein estimation as well and a general don't forget a cardio respiratory examination such sick patients especially patients with preeclampsia help syndrome or even with acute fatty liver of pregnancy can have difficulty breathing because of pulmonary edema so be cautious about that auscultate the chest also look for pallor icterus obviously you are going to evaluate for that also and pedal edema as well so you're going to check for all of these conditions right so if she is severely pale yes of course you would think of coincidental anemia right uh, you would also th like to think of hemolytic anemia so a lot uh, you know can be judged by uh, the physical examination also uh, petechiae uh, if there are present spontaneous petechiae that would go in favor of uh, uh, severe coagulopathy and then you would think more likely in terms of liver failure tremors again hepatic encephalopathy uh, yes uh, on your clinical examination you may be able to elicit uh, hepatosplenomegaly and very importantly hepatomegaly uh, especially tender hepatomegaly goes in favor of hepatitis right however yes right upper quadrant pain hepatomegaly can also be present with liver involvement in cases of severe preeclampsia and uh, uh, help syndrome right so but yes once you have to go for a thorough examination you do need to check if there is hepatosplenomegaly or not right uh, look for the presence of ascites you also have to monitor these patients uh, urine output as well right so urine output is important because you can understand that even in women with severe preeclampsia help syndrome uh, there could be a decrease in urine output right and also with um, acute fatty liver of pregnancy there can be decreased renal blood flow and acute kidney injury so you need to be cautious in uh, monitoring the patient's uh, input and output as well now moving on what are the investigations that you are going to perform okay so in the investigations you are going to check for the complete blood count okay so you will want to know the hemoglobin the platelet count and a wbc count also right so w wbc count uh, is generally also elevated in pregnancy may not tell you much uh, uh, in particular but if it is markedly elevated you would think of an in infective underlying process uh, you need to send a peripheral smear for evidence of 
hemolysis. So on peripheral smear, you will be able to see schistocytes and echinocytes and bur cells. You need to have a look at that. You will have to send for a complete liver function test, right? You want to see serum bilirubin, the levels of unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin, right? You need to see the liver enzymes, the transaminases, AST and ALT levels. You need to see uh, the uh, serum albumin levels, total protein levels. So yes, a complete liver function test uh, needs to be done. You need to send for renal function tests also. You need to check for blood urea. You need to check serum creatinine, right? You need to check for uh, serum uh, ammonia. You need to check for... Um, serum electrolytes, right? So in sick patients, these are investigations which you are anyways going to send for baseline. You need to have a baseline comparison in case the patient worsens after admission. You do need to have a coagulation profile, right? LDH, uh, raised LDH and decreased serum haptoglobin will go in favor of hemolysis. Okay. Now, what are the other investigations you are going to go for? The other investigations are a random blood sugar. Yes, you have to check a random blood sugar also at initial presentation because you know with liver dysfunction, severe liver dysfunction, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, she she could be in hypo, uh, she could be hypoglycemic. If she is drowsy and unconscious in that encephalopathy like state, yes, you do need to check the blood sugar also. Urine routine. So yes, you're going to send for the urine routine. Uh, one can do the dipstick in the emergency, but make sure you send for the complete urine routine microscopic examination also and don't forget these viral markers okay because your diagnosis of hepatitis will be supported by viral markers. So in fact, in all patients with jaundice in pregnancy, it is wise to send for viral markers. So at least you can eliminate one differential diagnosis straight away. Okay. And ultrasound. Now this ultrasound, you want to check for fetal well-being. Yes, this ultrasound to check for hepatomegaly. Yes all of these things that you can see, okay. In severe uh, cases of uh, preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, there may be a hepatic hematoma, you may be able to see that on ultrasound. Ultrasound characteristically does not give you any important information regarding the diagnosis of uh, hepatitis versus acute fatty liver of pregnancy or versus any other cause because the changes are very subtle, it is not very specific, right. So, so yes, you are doing an ultrasound for fetal well-being to see for hepatomegaly and to see any potential, you know, hepatic hematoma that may be there with HELP syndrome or severe preeclampsia cases. I mean, for that reason, yes, ultrasound is very valuable. So you need to have a baseline ultrasound. If you have a clinical picture suggestive of, uh, you know, obstructive jaundice or you have a clinical picture suggestive of gallstones, then ultrasound becomes a very valuable uh, investigation, right? So that you have to do. So you will have to cater your need for ultrasound based on the clinical profile of the patient. That is what I want to tell you here. Now, after you are done with your investigations, let's have a look at how you are going to differentiate based on clinical profile and lab parameters, right? Now, we have taken the pains to discuss each individual condition like I gave you description of cholestasis, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, preeclampsia and help is a huge humongous topic in itself which can be a top, which can be a video for some other time and uh, hepatitis I have not discussed separately because yes, I believe it is a medicine topic, it is covered there. So you can refer to your medicine uh, textbooks and your medicine content. But other than that, let us have a brief understanding of uh, how we are going to differentiate because in your exams, you are asked questions, you are given a clinical profile, you are given the symptoms, you are given the investigations and lab reports and you are asked to arrive at the most likely diagnosis, right? So let us get started. 
if you look at the main clinical presentation you see cholestasis help preeclampsia and acute fatty liver of pregnancy they usually present in the third trimester okay and hepatitis on the other hand can present in any trimester with cholestasis the main clinical presentation is going to be pruritus with hepatitis there is going to be jaundice and before that there is going to be a history of you know nausea vomiting anorexia malaise a uh, mild fever can be there with hepatitis a infection right and there is going to be this history of prodromal symptoms for about a week or two by the time the patient has jaundice okay we know that the uh, prodromal symptoms have started to subside by the time the woman uh, presents with jaundice so keep this profile clinical profile in mind now with help and preeclampsia yes there is going to be a history of hypertension a history of hypertension uh, especially is important when the patient has been seen previously in uh, pregnancy so hypertension goes in favor of help of preeclampsia epigastric pain right upper quadrant pain is a very characteristic of uh, help syndrome in a patient with preeclampsia there can be headache jaundice is also going to be there so this is going to be the main clinical presentation jaundice is generally mild with help and preeclampsia it's not severe jaundice then with acute fatty liver of pregnancy you see a similar clinical presentation but uh, there is moderate nausea and vomiting right and jaundice is also not too severe but this moderate nausea vomiting and jaundice this happens over and develops over a couple of uh, days or maybe a week and then it rapidly progresses it rapidly progresses and rapidly worsens woman could present directly with liver failure she may or may not have hypertension like i told you 50% cases can have hypertension also so any feature suggestive of severe liver dysfunction and liver failure rapidly deteriorating clinical profile will go more in favor of acute fatty liver of pregnancy now the serum transaminase levels ast and alt so in cholestasis now this is given in international units per liter in cholestasis they are elevated but they usually remain less than 200 in hepatitis they are markedly elevated markedly elevated liver enzymes in help syndrome they are also elevated but they are usually going to be below 300 below 300 in your acute fatty liver of pregnancy uh, also they have elevated liver enzymes somewhere in the range of 200 to 600 so i kind of remember that with acute fatty liver of pregnancy the derangement of liver enzymes is almost double as compared to help or preeclampsia right so keep that in mind and when differentiating acute fatty liver of pregnancy with hepatitis i keep in mind that in acute fatty liver of pregnancy the liver enzymes are going to be less than 1000 international units per liter so they're going to be less than this at least okay now moving on the serum bilirubin levels like in cholestasis mild jaundice okay rarely ever exceeds 5 gram per deciliter in hepatitis there is marked jaundice more than 10 In fact one important clinical clue regarding hepatitis is that as and when the uh, patient presents with hepatitis right you will start seeing a pattern during recovery time that the bilirubin levels continue to rise despite falling uh, serum enzyme level so that could be a important clinical clue in help syndrome and preeclampsia the jaundice is usually mild 1 to 2 g per deciliter in acute fatty liver of pregnancy the slightly more degree of jaundice because of more marked hemolysis but in any case the bilirubin levels are less than 10 g per deciliter if you want to compare it with hepatitis okay now 
moving on what about the serum creatinine levels what about the platelet levels hemolysis coagulation profile right in cholestasis none of this is going to be deranged right none of this is going to be deranged hemolysis is absent and coagulation profile is normal right now in hepatitis the serum creatinine levels are going to be normal the platelet count in hepatitis is also normal however yes if there is cirrhosis underlying cirrhosis then it can be decreased if there is underlying cirrhosis then it can be decreased okay there is no hemolysis okay the coagulation profile is also normal and the coagulation profile could be deranged if there is underlying cirrhosis okay so until and unless the hepatitis is severe enough to lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation that's unlikely with hepatitis a and hepatitis b that we see more commonly all right and yes then you know uh, with worsening clinical profile or dic in a hepatitis e infection you can have a deranged clinical profile and that is why i said that it is very important to go for uh, you know viral markers in patients presenting with jaundice in pregnancy so you have a diagnosis of hepatitis ruled out immediately now moving on what about help and preeclampsia so the serum creatinine levels are going to be elevated okay in preeclampsia in help they could be elevated because of underlying preeclampsia but the elevation is not uh, too marked okay the uh, mildly elevated serum creatinine is there platelets count are decreased hemolysis is present but it is mild okay the coagulation profile is usually normal like i explained to you unless it gets complicated by dic okay in acute fatty liver of pregnancy on the other hand serum creatinine is markedly elevated because of acute kidney injury that is seen here the platelets are decreased that is also there hemolysis is marked uh, very severe in uh, acute fatty liver of pregnancy as compared to uh, him, uh, help syndrome and preeclampsia your coagulation profile is also deranged you have elevated pt values elevated prothrombin time and don't forget if you have hypoglycemia if you have hyperammonemia the diagnosis goes in favor of acute fatty liver of pregnancy so in clinical practice you can easily make the diagnosis of cholestasis fairly simple the management is discussed in a separate video right with hepatitis you need to make a diagnosis viral markers will help you along with these lab parameters and it is important to find out the diagnosis of hepatitis because the management is mainly conservative hepatitis is managed in the same way during pregnancy as it is managed outside of pregnancy with conservative management and there is no immediate need to deliver the baby with help and acute fatty liver of pregnancy even with whatever distinction the distinctive features that i have told you even then the diagnosis can get confusing sometimes okay anyways acute fatty liver of pregnancy is a rare scenario okay this is more common help and preeclampsia so we try to differentiate between the two as much as possible however even if you are not able to differentiate in clinical practice the management necessarily does not change because the management is mainly supportive controlling bp you know uh, managing the deranged coagulation profile intensive clinical support and delivery of the baby 
because both acute fatty liver of pregnancy and HELP syndrome, severe preeclampsia, both of these conditions, they improve after delivery, right? So we try to differentiate as much as possible based on the clinical profile, but the management essentially does not change, right? So our main focus with jaundice in pregnancy is to identify causes which can be treated conservatively separately. So you have to rule out medical causes, you have to rule out hepatitis, you do that, you have to rule out any surgical cause because these two conditions, these two conditions will need delivery of the baby. So with this, I will wrap up this video. I uh, also assume that many questions have been created in your minds regarding acute fatty liver of pregnancy and its pathology, its diagnosis, its clinical presentation. This itself in, in itself is a huge topic, maybe it, uh, a topic for another video uh, and another discussion. Thank you.